So this is the video for the answers on the practice booklet for 2.3.1 factors affecting human health. The first question is on DNA structure. Which part of a plant cell contains DNA? It says to underline the correct answer. Make sure we underline it because sometimes they can be fussy and not give you the mark if you circle it. So it's the nucleus that contains DNA, which we learned in year 10. The diagram below shows a small section of DNA. Use information in the diagram above and your own knowledge to answer the following questions. Underline the correct answer in each question. Which molecules make it the two strands? So our two strands are our backbone of our DNA base and they contain a sugar and a phosphate group. There are four bases, A, G, T and C. How are they paired? So they're complementary base pairing and A always binds with T and G always binds with C. What term is used to describe the structure of DNA is a double helix because it's two-stranded, twisted together into a helix shape. Complete the sentence below. The order of the bases A, G, T and C in DNA forms a code which controls how amino acids are linked together to form different proteins. Outline the basic structure of DNA and explain the meaning and importance of the genetic code. So... First thing we have to say is a lot of information already in the first few questions. So DNA is a double helix. Tell me what a double helix is. So it's two strands that are twisted together. The strands are made up of the sugar and phosphate and they're connected by bases. So they're connected by the bases but twist them together. The four bases, you need to be able to name them and spell them correctly. Okay, so let's put in A, T, G and C. You have to know how to spell them. So we've got adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine. The complementary base pairing, we've got A to T, C and G. They're found in the nucleus. And our triplet code is just that three bases, code for the amino acid, which makes a protein. So that sort of goes into that question C there. Question two then, looking at our inheritance. So a grey-bodied fruit fly was mated with a black-bodied fruit fly. All of the F1, all of the F1 offspring were grey-bodied. So here, we are looking at the outcome of the children. So all of the offspring were grey-bodied. So they haven't told us in the question, but we know then that grey-bodied must be dominant. And the black-bodied must be recessive. So you know straight away the black body fly must be little b, little b, okay? They said to choose the letter A in a second, which you make sure that we will, okay? But we need to work out if the grey bodied fly, big B, big B, or is he big B, little b? Because either one would give him grey bodied. If all of the offspring are grey bodied, he has to be big B, big B, okay? Because if he's heterozygous, big B, little b, he can pass on a black bodied gene to offspring. But obviously he hasn't because they all come out grey. So it says, using the letters A to represent the alleles for the two different body colours, complete the planet square below to show the offspring produced from the mating between the grey bodied and the black bodied. So here's my grey bodied and then my black bodied. And we end up with all of the children with one dominant allele, which you can see, which means they are all grey. However, they are all then carriers. So they're heterozygous and they are all carriers for the black bodied gene colour. Second part that says complete a Punnett square below to show the offspring produced when two of the F1 offspring are self together. They only ever ask this question is if I look back at this one, if I zoom up, go up bigger, they only ask this question if the previous Punnett square, all of the offspring are the same. Otherwise, if they're different, it's really hard to decide well, which two do you pick, okay? They only ever ask this question if two of the offspring are the same. So I'm going to take this one and this one. doesn't matter which two you pick because, again, they are all the exact same. So I'm going to zoom out a sec and then you can see them. So I've got one, big A, little a, big A, little a. Then I end up then with a different combination. So I've got one homozygous dominant two that are heterozygous, and I've got a homozygous recessive. And what's the ratio of the different phenotypes? So it's remembering then what phenotype means. And the phenotype is the physical characteristic. So it's the actual colour. So it's the physical characteristic. When we then look at this Punnett square, 
Africa, we've got a dominant allele. They're going to be grey. Even though they've got a recessive allele, they still have the one dominant, so they're going to be grey. They're going to be grey, and we have a recessive, so he is going to be black. So we have a ratio of three to one being to the grey. Okay. Our next question is, Manx cats have no tails. This condition arose as a mutation sometime in the 1700s or the 1800s. The mutation produced a dominant allele that resulted in the lack of a tail. What is meant by the term dominant allele? So it's the allele that controls the characteristic of the organism. So you only need one of, of the dominant alleles and you will have that characteristic. The allele for no tail can be represented by the letter B, Cats that lack the dominant allele have normal length tails. In the following cross, two heterozygous, so that's important, Manx cats were mated together. Complete the following information by writing in the genotype of both parents. You must select a suitable letter to represent the allele for the normal length tail. So now we have to look at our keyword genotype. We know phenotype is a physical characteristic. Our genotype then is the set of alleles the organism has. So it can be one of three things. It can either be big B, big B, big B, little B, or little B, little B. The genotype can only ever be one of those three things. So it said they were heterozygous, and that's important then for our question, because heterozygous means our alleles are different. So if our alleles are different, it can't be big B, big B, they're the same. And it can't be big B, little, little B, little B, because they're the same. It has to be big B, little B. And it's where I've got my answer from. Complete the planet squared to show the cross. So I've just put my alleles in, big B, little B, big B, little B. And I've come out with the same outcome. The dominant allele is lethal in the homozygous condition. The kittens died before birth. How many kittens out of a litter of eight would be expected to survive in the above cross? So we need to go back to the question. So we're looking at the homozygous condition. So if it's homozygous, it's the same, but we're looking at in the dominant. So I'm looking for when it's big B, big B. And in the cross, only one out of four has the dominant homozygous condition. So that one would die out of a litter of four. But we're looking out of a litter of eight. So I'm just going to double it. So two of them would die, which then means six of them would survive. A breeder of Manx cats wants to ensure that all kittens survive. Give the phenotypes and genotypes of the two cats you would have to mate in order to do this. So the phenotype, you'd have a Manx cat with a normal. And the genotype, the Manx cat would have to be heterozygous. Obviously, if it's homozygous dominant, it's lethal. And then we need a normal one that is two recessives, okay? And then we can even, if you wanted, draw the Punnett squash, we can show we end up with no cats in the lethal homozygous dominant condition. They're either homozygous recessive or they're heterozygous. Question four, be in my own food labels. BMA values indicate the following body types, underweight, normal, overweight, obese. Use the information above to find the maximum mass of an 110 centimetre tall adult before they are classed as obese. And it's 97 kilograms. The equation used to calculate BMI is given by BMI equals mass divided by height squared. Use this equation to calculate the BMI for a 160 centimetre tall adult who has a mass of 70 kilograms. So, first thing we need to do, okay, is convert our height into metres, okay, because height is measured in metres, not centimetres. So, 1.6 centimetres is 1.6 metres. Then I square my height, because height is squared, so 1.6 squared is 2.56. And then I do 70 divided by 2.56, which gives me an answer of 27.3. Then if I look, he's classed as overweight. You haven't got to write overweight, but just for you to note. The B treat wise is a new way to label treats like chocolates and sweets. The information below is from a chocolate bar, the Cocoa Crunch Bar. 
Use information above to answer the following questions on the Cocoa Crunch Bar. It's like two of the food groups have the highest percentage so of daily guide, guided daily amount. So I've got calories, 9%, sugars, 26 fat, 10 saturated, 25 salt, 5 So my two highest were my sugars were 26 and my saturated are 25 the Cocoa Crunch Bar has 5 grams of saturate, which is 25% of your GDA. Calculate the total GDA for saturates as well. So if 5 is 25%, 25 goes into 100 four times. So we do 5 times 4, which is 20 grams. The Cocoa Fruit Bar has been made as a healthy alternative option to the Cocoa Crunch Bar. So chocolate fruit bar, give two reasons why the chocolate fruit bar is healthier. It's because it has less fats, less sugars, and less fat. Calculate the total number of calories in two cocoa fruit bars. Well, in one, there's 150 calories, and then so in two, there's going to be 300 calories. Later in the day, a student goes running. Running uses 15 kilocalories of energy per minute. For how long must the student run to use the energy in both? So, 300 calories, if we use 15 calories per minute, then we know 300 divided by 15, he'll need to run for 20 minutes. Okay, so, last question. Diabetes is a common disease in which a person can have high blood sugar level. Distinguish between type 1 and type 2. Type 1, the body doesn't produce insulin. And type 2, the body doesn't respond to the insulin, so it doesn't decrease the blood glucose levels as it should. The graphs below show the blood sugar levels from two different people. One is suffering from diabetes and the other is a non-sufferer. Okay, so here is the account, account then for the differences between the two graphs obtained in the study. Describe the information that graph A shows, describe what graph B shows, explain how you can deduce from the graphs which is the sufferer. So I have the graph here for us, I'll zoom in slightly. In the first graph then, as you can see, insulin is produced in response to the increased sugar levels. So insulin's on the bottom, glucose on the top. So as the glucose levels start to increase, immediately the insulin spikes at its highest, okay? Obviously it's detected, um, a lot of glucose in the blood, so the insulin is, is produced by, by the pancreas very quickly. Because the insulin's been produced, the blood glucose levels return to normal. So at the starting, it is here, and it returns to its normal level. And that's because glucose is converted into glycogen in the liver. Graph 2, then, is a diabetic because the insulin spikes before the blood glucose does. So obviously, the person has injected insulin prior to eating food, prior to that increase in blood glucose. With that then, the blood sugar is converted by the liver into glycogen.